Good evening. Welcome to Emmanuel. My name is Tab Monroe, and I am the pastor here. Uh, at Emmanuel, we strive to be an inclusive, a thoughtful, a creative, and an involved community. Black lives matter to us. If you identify as gay, lesbian, bi, transgender, gender nonconforming, we welcome and affirm you. Our physical space sits on the unceded land of the Coast Salish people, and we honor the Coast Salish people, elders both past, present, and future generations. All are welcome, and we're glad that you're with us this evening. So welcome to all of you in the space. Also, welcome to all of you watching the live stream, wherever you're watching from. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, somebody who is a great uh, mentor to me, theological mentor, and a great inspiration to me. Uh, Father James Allison is the writer of many great books. James, did you bring any books with you? Somebody asked me earlier. No? Okay. So he's working on one, so, but that one he can't give you because it's still in his head. Um, so we'd have to give you James, and that's, we're not ready to do that yet. So, but that one will be coming out at some point. But um, uh, just so grateful for all of James's wisdom. Um, James is brilliant, but also I think the thing I appreciate, appreciate most about him is just how winsome he is and um, funny and um, just has an amazing way of explaining really complicated things in ways that this small mind can understand. So uh, really grateful to have James with us this evening. A couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, if you go out to the narthex, narthex is a fancy church word for the, the, the room between the outside and the sanctuary. <laughs> um, and you take a right, there's a restroom right there. Also, we're going to have a short, um, or we're going to have a, a little small reception afterwards. If you want to go downstairs, there's stairwells right to the left as you go into the narthex, and we're going to have um, uh, some, some beverages and some food and some good stuff if you want to come down and join us there. Thanks to Lynn Razel. Lynn's right back there for organizing that. Thank you so much. Um, and then also, uh, we're going to take up an uh, offering. Uh, this is a free event, so no pressure, but uh, at some point we're going to pass the plates along. And, uh, uh, you know, James uh, does a lot of this work. You know, this is what he does, and so we really want to support his ability to continue to, to write and teach and do retreats and all the things that he's doing. So don't worry, we're paying him no matter what, uh, but we'll get to pay him even more uh, from your generosity this evening. So thank you for helping us out with that. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Father James Allison. I think I can put this aside for the moment. Yes, from up here, the spitting distance is not so <laughs> is not so close. Well, thank you very much, Dad, for. Uh, welcoming you in that way. And the, the book which you described is in my head is, is not only in my head, it is now in manuscript form. And indeed, I'm going to be talking about it here today. I'm going to be trying to unpack some of it with you uh, today. That's my, that was what it was suggested to me that I do, and I leapt at the opportunity, thinking, ooh -hoo, they might even buy a copy <laughs> a year or so down the line when, when one comes out. But, uh, but I'll start with something not in the book, because I want to open a question to you, which is what I'll be looking uh, to unravel. In about the year 1580, the Inquisitor of Aragon, that's part of Spain, was summoned to a small town in the interior of Aragon, where there had been an accusation of witches doing witchy things. I don't know what witchy things are, but they were doing them. Um, and so it was thought that it would be a good idea to bring in the Inquisition. And so he went along and listened to the accusations and the accused and said, to all the people present, this is nonsense. These people are not witches. The reason I know that they're not witches is because they have been baptized, so they cannot be possessed by evil spirits. They can only be obsessed by evil spirits. So they're not witches. 
Therefore, what this is, is an outbreak of mob violence against them. And therefore, I'm going to put you, the whole town, under an interdict, as it was called, meaning you're not allowed, to, none of you can celebrate any sacrament. There has been no marriages, no weddings, funerals, of course, we can't uh, avoid, no baptisms, no confession, no mass, for a month or until as long as it takes you to make your peace with each other. And then he went away. And it worked. Now, believe it or not, that was the first critique in Western society of witch burning. <laughs> and it seems rather odd that the first person in Western society ever to have critiqued witch burning was one of the people who we would have regarded as the archetypical witch burners, <laughs> i.e. an inquisitor general. <laughs> but the really interesting thing about that is that he picked up something, which is, if you disbelieve in witches, then you start to work out what's really going on. <laughs> you see that? It was a strangely scientific moment. It actually is a strange thing, but three of the four, four first critics, critics of witch burning were either priests or pastors. Um, and it was for the same reason. Because they refused to believe in the guilt of the witches, the explanation for what was going on became something else. Why is that a fundamental question? Because it says something very profound about the relationship between Christianity and finding the truth. I guess if many of you were asked to say, why did people stop burning witches? The answer would be something like, well, we became rational, there was the Enlightenment, um, and so we stopped all that superstitious nonsense. But the historical facts show a rather different story. The historical fact suggests that it's as we stopped believing in witches that we became rational. Not because we became rational, we stopped burning witches. And it's a very important distinction because the because we became rational version, A, suggests that our knowledge starts here and is passed on to us by pieces of information of the sort, for instance. Horse paste cures COVID. Boom! Now I know that horse paste cures COVID. Now I needn't have an injection or wear a mask, okay? But information comes to the head. The other is that it's actually changes in how we relate to each other that enable new things to be seen. It's as we're able to get along together in certain ways that we, be able, we, be, we become able to fix on what is really going on rather than whatever some strange mob feeling what we would nowadays call a conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theory is simply witch hunting gone high tech. Uh, uh, whatever some conspiracy theory might point to as the cause of our, of our evils. The one suggests that knowledge comes head down, and the other suggests that knowledge opens up sideways, relationally. And that it's as we change our relationships with each other, so it becomes possible to what work work out what's going on. And if you think about it, let's get back to our dear witch. Um, this is, it's easy to see how this works. Let us suppose that in your town, I, perhaps this happens in Tacoma sometimes, uh, you have a hailstorm, a big hailstorm. But hailstorms are rather curious in that different microclimates mean that you can get an area with a very light hail and right next to it an area with incredibly heavy hail. And so it appears to be a discriminating agent. There are some farmer's fields and crops that will have been destroyed completely and some that will have been touched lightly. In other words, 
this terrible unexpected thing has clearly got a social edge to it. It's known who it was out to get. So whose fault was it? And that, of course, is the, the question which we most easily ask. If there's an outbreak of rivalry amongst us because someone has got more than someone or someone has got less than someone or someone has been more harmed than someone, it is much, much easier to say, whose fault is it? understood as something which we can sort out quite quickly than it is to say, what's going on? And of course, very quickly. You can imagine towns with, or villages with uh, hailstorm adjacent damage of different degrees and rivalry as to why this person was destroyed and this one wasn't destroyed. Very quickly attention gets focused to the old lady, a widow who lives with her black cat and the edge of town, and she's slightly dotty. Um, she makes interesting teas out of local herbs. Uh, and rumours are about her flying. Her broomstick seems to be very malleable. And, and before long, everybody knows that it was she who put the evil eye on Farmer X or Farmer Y, and that was why his field got more hailstone storm damage. And then, of course, the whole village comes together to get rid of her, which they do. Of course, no judicial process, witch hunts are, and judicial process do not go on well together, which is why that small town in Aragon didn't get to burn its witch. <laughs> the judicial process turned up <laughs> and said, nope, <laughs> judicial process if you're in a mob situation, the last thing you want is a judicial process. It will get in the way. When lynchings used to happen in this great country, uh, the sheriffs were invited to step outside and mysteriously abandon their uh, prison cells when it was necessary for the good old boys to come in and remove whoever was in the, uh, the cell. You don't, want, you don't want due process to get in the way of what people know is, is right. So, the poor witch gets burnt, and everybody is together and peaceful. Well, of course, it'll only last for a short time, and they'll have to do it again in some other way, and blame someone else or something else the next time something goes wrong. But one of the things that they will never, ever learn is what causes hail. The one thing that will be completely outside their grasp is the ability to stand back from immediate causes we can do something about and start to begin to think of distant causes in the face of which we are indifferent. It's actually really quite difficult to achieve sufficient social peacefulness to be able to look at something and see it for what it is. Because mostly we want to work out whatever is going on, we want to work out a way to profit from it. <laughs> and we're much less concerned about what it actually is. I don't know whether you remember the conspiracy theories that went round about, about the China virus, as your beloved former leader uh, used to talk about it. And how quickly significant parts of industry started to try to make a profit from the whole situation rather than getting together and saying how can we work out what is going to be the best, fastest and easiest way to get medical protection, etc, etc, for people. It's actually very, very difficult for humans to have enough peace amongst ourselves that we're able to look outside what is immediately convenient for the group and start to discover distant and non-personal forms of causality. That's an enormous part of the role played by Christianity in the history of uh, the world, starting with Western and Eastern Europe, developing through the Middle Ages, 
and leading eventually to the sound, what we now call the scientific revolution. What it's required is for people to have suspicion of immediate social causes, <laughs> such that it becomes possible to stand back and say, yes, I can see why it would be suitable to get rid of X, but will that really solve the issue? And when you get used to distant and impersonal causes, then you can start to think scientifically. Now, why have I started with that in a talk that is uh, at least advertised as being about matters LGBTQ and truthfulness? Because it's because of what I will want to bring out to you is that exactly the same mechanism is how we began to understand what is true about people who are LGBTQ. And the, the process of learning that, the process of actually discovering what's true and beginning to inhabit it, rather than it being a question of scientists learning something and then passing down the knowledge and saying, now you've all got to get with it, was actually a process of people coming to realize that people alongside them were okay and the people themselves beginning to realize that they were okay and no longer being threatened by them. So that there was sufficient distance for the scientists to be able to ask scientific questions, such as, I wonder what makes this person tick, rather than, this is a problem, we must deal with it somehow. <laughs> it took 450 years to get from the beginning of the recognition of these people being present to the clear understanding that we're dealing with what I call a non-pathological minority variant in the human condition. But it was a fairly clearly historically spaced, slow uncovering of a scapegoat mechanism in exactly the same way as how we moved beyond witch hunting. It's that slow relational space which creates the condition of possibility of knowledge that I want to bring out to you today. So having said that, that's my little introductory piece. I'll now say what I think, if you like, many of us are used to as the wrong relationship between Christianity and this. <laughs> and to show how, how many of us, in fact, have been brought up uh, with a form of Christianity that encourages scapegoating, <laughs> that would have, as it were, um, what is the play, cheered on the witch burners rather than, and does, <laughs> uh, rather than attempting to stop uh, the witch hunting. And please notice that in the world of that religion, there is inevitably going to be a battle between science and religion. And it suits them that it be that way. Because it's a battle between two top-down sorts of knowledge. Top-down rational knowledge and top-down religious knowledge. Which is a false account of how rationality is developed, because rationality is developed relationally, and it's a false account of religion, but it's very convenient for those who want to hold the reins of power. So, let me open up, if you like, the sacrificial understanding with which too many of us have been brought up, and many of us assume is what Christianity is about, entirely falsely, but we do. The narrative goes something like this. God created the world a very long time ago, it was essentially good, and then at the end God had a sort of a strange, uh, I don't know, surfeit of joy and created humanity and saw that it was very, very good. But very quickly, uh, Adam fell, and his fall was such a catastrophe that really it cast a pall of depravity over the whole of creation. Creation fell and became something radically depraved, 
such that there was no good in it. And of course, this fall was a terrible, and everyone's resulting sin, was a terrible offence against God. And God was um, mighty pissed, uh, <laughs> to be frank, and um, really didn't know what to do about it because he had a little sort of internal battle between I've got my mercy on one hand, and I suppose I ought to be merciful, but then there's my justice on the other. Really, come on, which one is going to win out? I don't really know. But then, luckily, Jesus was around and um, tapped him on the shoulder and said, uh, you know, uh, no human can possibly pay the price to upset your uh, greatly disturbed uh, honour, but, um, but because I'm God too, I could go down and become a human, and then I could pay the price that would satisfy your wrath. Uh, and, um, and then you'd be happy, wouldn't you, dear? Um, and so uh, God said, yes, okay, that'll do, splendid. But I mind you, it's, I, I'm, I'm still very, very angry with everybody else. It's only the ones, only the ones who go along with you that I'm going to. This is serious. It's only the ones who go along with you who are going to get saved. So Jesus goes along and pays the price, okay? Ransoms everybody satisfies the wrath of God. And so God says, absolutely splendid. Okay, all the people who are covered by Jesus' blood are now saved, um, and everybody else is damned. Because, well, because, I mean, it, the eye of a hurricane is a peaceful place, but there's still a damn hurricane. I mean, let's be, let's be frank. Okay, so, all this works very nicely. So we are taught how to be saved, and we come to be saved, and then what are we taught? Well, we're taught that Jesus paid the price. And you think, the price for what? The price for sin. Well, what is sin? Well, luckily we have this book which lists in very great detail an awful lot of these sins um, and goes over and over and over. And because we're Christians, we tend to have a, we've, we tend to, what shall we say, pick and choose a little bit. Uh, around some of the things. We're not so keen on the anti-shrimp and anti-bacon stuff, but um, the other stuff we'll go for. And so we have a clear list. We have a the clear list of sins for which the price was paid. Okay? Well, and that's perfectly fine. So what you must now do, you now know that this is the price, the list of sins that have been uh, paid for. So don't challenge that. And now just behave yourselves. So Christianity is now a religion of morals, which is basically all to do with behaving. The bill's been paid, nothing more to be done, now just behave. And if you need reminding, then a kind of a Miss Piggy bleat uh, will, will come out. I love you so much that I died for you, now behave! <laughs> the master of emotional blackmail at work again. Um, so, now here's one of the important things about that in a version, again, with which many of us was brought up. There's the list, which is fixed, there's the price that was paid, and if you try to suggest that any one of those things uh, really isn't a sin, then you're dissing the one who paid the price. Yeah. Say, you can't change the list after the price has been paid. What restaurant would allow you to alter what you've had after the price? It wouldn't happen. It's fixed. Forever. It's God's will. So that's the two wings of the, the trap. But the third wing of the trap, which is the one which often gets us, or the third edge of the trap, is the one which often we don't think about too much, is this. Because humanity is radically depraved. You can't really learn anything from what is. Yeah, our creation is good or was good in some sense, but because humans have fallen, now we can't really learn. Because if we learn something that's against what it says in the Bible, well, that's clearly demonic learning, isn't it? That's clearly the wisdom of this world. And we can't trust that. We have to trust 
every word as it is written in Scripture. Well, you don't need to know much history to know that that has been a trap that has got caught up almost in every, has produced problems in almost every generation, produced a problem with astronomy. The Hebrew Scriptures were clearly written in a, what, how would we say it, a terra-centric world. And we've discovered that at least our pocket of the universe is heliocentric, <laughs> let alone the rest of the universe. <laughs> so, whoop! So that must not be believed. Uh, geologists, it, we had a, a problem with geology when they began to assess it was more than 6,000 years uh, old. Whoop! Another problem because if you tot up all the numbers, including you know people with improbably long uh, lifespans like Methuselah, um, it all adds up to 6,000. So um, that was another problem there. And then you had a problem with biology, and evolution of species, and guess what? The 21st century's version, or the late 20th, early 21st century version of the same problem is sexual orientation and gender identity. <laughs> doesn't say anything about that. In fact, it says just the reverse, and certain passages then become fundamentally necessary to justify that nothing has changed. But you see that the key thing about the radical depravity is not, curiously, its accusation of us as being bad. It's the impossibility of anything that is from us being a source of learning about who we really are. Well, this is actually denying that creation is good. And it's only, it makes, it's curious, it turns Christianity into a salvation cult that is literally cut off from any understanding of creation. We are saved from a reality rather than saved into a reality, to put it another way. Does that make, does that make sense? Is that a story you've heard before? Yeah, some nodding, some nodding going on. But you can see that it's a sacrificial account made sacred. And of course, thereafter, those who belong must go along with it. And anybody who is seen to be dodgy, not holding on to the full package, they are out. And they can be persecuted. Or when society gets too big and too secular, like our society, then holding on to those is are right and society is persecuting us for holding our beliefs so we must have rights to be able to allow to hate the hate the people we want to hate in order to keep our sacred structure that's what religious freedom is you understand how that that works how the triangle is a trap and the thing about it is that it's a trap that constantly needs re to repeat who it's over against wicked scientists wicked secularists Wicked this, that, or the other, in order to shore up identity. That's how you can tell something is sacrificial. If it needs to repeat itself in order to shore up identity. So it, there's a kind of a built-in paranoia there that's necessary for this thing to go forward. And the one thing that that prevents is learning. Because if you know what is true anyhow, you can never occupy the space of discovering that it might be something different than what you think as you come alongside different realities. Does that make sense? Incidentally, that is obviously a version I'm talking, I guess, to mostly Protestants here, that that is tended to be in the background of evangelical Protestantism. The Catholic version is, as you would expect, a more personalised version. With us, the sacrifice is much more visible in our, in our clergy, especially our upper clergy, many of whom, of course, are closeted gay men, who at some stage in their lives have sacrificed who they really are out of terror that it is so evil that who, how can they be allowed to be and have accepted a persona, what I will call a magisterial persona, instead of themselves. Yes, 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 I will be anyone you tell me to be, so long as as, as, as you ignore that. 
And so you get, I'm afraid, this rather frequent phenomenon of these very sacrificial uh, Catholic clerics who have a particular need to clean out the stables, particularly on this issue. And anybody who's ever lived alongside them knows perfectly well that it's their own inner stable that they're really uh, cleaning out, but no one dares to say it. The old don't ask, don't tell rules and a certain gentility stop anybody being able to hold a mirror up to them and say, there, there, dear, sit down, have a nice cup of tea, as opposed to a nasty cup of tea. I've always wondered why people get offered nice cups of tea. <laughs> uh, there, there, have a nice cup of tea. Look in the mirror and do understand a little bit that it's yourself you're trying to drive out. And no one really needs to do that. None of you... You don't need to drive yourself out. No one here wants to drive you out. But uh, it would be awfully nice if you didn't feel that we are all the Augean stables and you are Heracles. Okay. So there's a Catholic version of that. And of course, the Catholic version works in the same way as a group of people who, now that they've got the truth, need to hold firm to it and use it as a way of casting wicked enemies for the church that enables them to hold on to their structure. It's very similar. Our version is more clericalized. Your version is more laicized. Guess what? That's what the Reformation did for us. So, this is obviously nonsense. Unless Christianity is, in fact, a sacrificial cult. But what I would like to suggest, and this is what I've been at work at in the book, which I'm trying to sell you even though it hasn't yet been published, um, is that, in fact, Christianity is no such thing that given a proper organic account of what Christianity is about, moving on in the LGBT matter is obviously just the organic way that you would expect Christianity to unfold given its beginnings. So let me try and start with that. With the notion, I mean, this always comes down to the notion of sacrifice the role of sacrifice within Christianity. Well, sacrifice for us is a very double-edged word, isn't it? If someone demands sacrifice, that's a cruel thing. But if someone gives themselves sacrificially, that's a good thing. Wouldn't that be a fair, a fair truth? If, imagine uh, that a building is on fire, the fire department turn up, actually, what is it called, Lone Star uh, 911. Have you seen that on television? That's my favourite, because I've got a really cute gay couple in there. <laughs> but anyhow, it's, cent it's centred on Austin, Texas. Uh, but anyhow, that's, an that's another matter. But anyhow, imagine that a fire, a fire truck turns up and... Um, there's the elderly fire commander, he's down there, and it's clear that the building is in a terrible, terrible state and everything is about to give and collapse. And then they hear a baby's cry from an upper room, and so the fire commander says to, you know, smart young whippersnapper, the hero, you go up there and get it. I'm sending you, you go. So, young whippersnapper, climbs up the ladder, manages to get in there, and with a beautiful rugby pass, manages to throw the baby out of the window, but then is immediately consumed in the flames and dies. Okay? Elderly fire captain has sacrificed Joe for the purpose of rescuing the baby. Yeah? That's a bad thing. With a bit of luck, that's going to be on elderly fire captain's conscience for the rest of his life. If, on the other hand, without any background fire captain, Joe, on his way up the ladder, sees this tremendously dangerous situation and says, do you know, this is what my life is for. I'm going to rush in and rescue that baby, even though this is terribly dangerous, and I may well lose my life, but so what? This is actually what being alive is all about. Whoop! And does that. Throws the baby out of the window and perishes in the fire. He's given himself freely into a space, hasn't he? Now, 
Let's transfer that into Trinitarian theology. In bad Trinitarian theology, we have the Father sending the Son for the salvation, which is the Father sacrificing someone, which is horrible. In genuine Trinitarian theology, which understands that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are merely relations within God, there is no outside Father sending the Son in. The Father is the discovering of the Son, of his joy in doing what he's doing. In other words, it's not someone sacrificing someone else. It is pure self-giving. It's a hugely important distinction, and one which we don't usually get, because usually we are binitarians <laughs> with two gods and then a little half-baked third god <laughs> that, that flutters by later on dove's wings. Um, but usually we've got a, a, a father sending a son to do something, which is two gods, two, centers of, two separate centres of consciousness. Trinity, it doesn't make much sense to talk about a centre of consciousness at all, but there's only one of them. <laughs> so, let's think what it might be like, and this is the thought of my guru, René Girard, a French theoretician of violence, if what is really going on here, what the whole of the gospel is, is God in whom there is no violence, no wrath, no rivalry with us or anybody else. That's what makes God God. And he looks down at this lovable but violent bunch of semi-advanced apes who have somehow managed to bootstrap ourselves out of being simply apes into the beginning of culture, but are awfully prone to fall back on building our unity and therefore our peace and our security over against each other by casting someone or some group out so as to have culture and civilization and all those things at the expense of others. So he sees that, and he knows that basically that's a recipe for futility. We're going to have to carry on sacrificing, and we're always going to be actually denigrating ourselves, making ourselves less than what we are by our surviving at the expense of others. Because all we are is extremely reflexive and imitative apes. So what we do to another, we are in fact doing to ourselves. We're entirely projective animals. We're just much better at it than our nearest ape relatives. We have many more mirror neurons. We imitate so well that we don't even notice that we're doing it. So God takes a look at this and says, ah, they need their violence assuaged. Their need for vengeance is constant. That's how they keep themselves going. But this is too sad. They'll never grow up and enjoy being who they are. But the whole point of my creating them was so that they, sh they should enjoy themselves and enjoy me. So, I'm going to come amongst them as one of them and occupy the space that is typically the space of their violence, the space into which they put people other than themselves because they're so frightened of who they are. I'm going to occupy that space and show them, yep, you, you did that to me. And I, I, I'm not out to get you for this. I'm not, uh, I'm not calling you out on it. I'm just showing you what this is as the possibility that you might all go, oh my God, so that's what we've been doing. Which in grand language is called penitence. And then start to be set free to play another game. <laughs> Not having to repeat the game with the bad old rep repetitive, the one who wins is the one who manages to gather the biggest gang and throw out the weakling. <laughs> A different game. What will it be like to start to 
receive who we are from the thrown out one and not to mind. Say, yeah, actually, I'm really pleased to have been brought into being by having been befriended by the person who everyone else wanted to throw out. Because that's, that's what's going on here in this model. But I hope you see that one of the consequences of that is the beginning of the possibility of us saying, OK, it's not any religious law or any religious text that is somehow keeping us in a trap, but our interpretation of religious law and religious texts, which we usually use <laughs> as ways to confirm our sacrificial bias. But what we have in our midst is someone who has undone all that from within. He's given himself into that space and said, yes, you do this. And I've occupied the space of death so that you don't need to be frightened of it. I've occupied the space of shame. So that all that hidden shame which you try to cover over by making yourselves good, bah, forget it. Allow your shame to be held tenderly by someone who likes you and see whether together you can't start discovering what is good for you, what works. What makes you tick? And I'm really curious to see how you'll take it. Creation is an adventure. I've entered into it because I want to see where it'll go. It'll be something fun and daring. And not a trap at all. I hope you can see that according to which understanding of sacrifice you have, you have either no possibility of learning, or the human conditions of possibility for learning. And it's that which it seems to me to be is absolutely vital to understand for dealing with a whole lot of the issues which faith face us. It's no accident to me that the same people who don't want to recognise scientific uh, knowledge, genuinely achieved scientific knowledge, about which I'll look at in just a second, concerning gay people, are the same people who don't want to acknowledge climate change or that smoking affects your health, or that vaccines work and are good for you. Why? Because the suggestion that knowledge affects sacred belonging, and therefore is a bad thing against which one has an allergy, rather than the possibility that actually what Jesus is doing and the work of the Holy Spirit can keeping that work alive is constantly opening us up to inhabit the wisdom of God. What the Old Testament referred to as wisdom, the New Testament usually refers to as the Holy Spirit. But it's the same, it's the understanding that there is a deep intelligibility in all things that is trying to make itself available to us, that's trying to take us up inside it so that we can enjoy it and become more than what we think, rather than hunker down and batten down the hatches in case everything gets worse. It's an entirely different understanding of how atonement works, and one which, once you understand it, the New Testament texts mean bing, 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 start to come completely alive. Now, how has this worked with matters LGBTQ? Well, and sorry if some of you have heard me on this before, but it's, I think it's worth repeating. There's a history at work here. One of the really odd things that happened in our society, and by our society, in this case I mean English-speaking society, started happening at the turn of the 17th century, beginning of the 17th century, was the invention of what the historians call companionate marriage. And why was that a revolution? because our societies had, up until then, it had been gradually drifting apart during the Middle Ages, but our societies had, up until then, been much more like what we would see in a modern Islamic society, which sociologists refer to as a homosocial society. After a very short period of being together as infants, boys and girls are separated, girls are brought up amongst women, boys are brought up amongst men, and socialization is very carefully controlled. Marriages are organised, usually very young, 
Uh, that has been the way for most human societies most of the time. The bizarre thing is that we assume that our heterosocial society is natural. No such thing as natural, mate. <laughs> it isn't. It's a product of a quite extraordinarily long process of it becoming possible to imagine some sort of equality between men and women as being absolutely basic. And it becoming possible, therefore, to imagine that, for instance, marriage might be because they like each other, for which friendship becomes possible. And it's the presence of this new world of what one might call heterosociality, with people getting married out of friendship and then being each other's best friend. Complete novelty for the Middle Ages. One of the interesting things about St Thomas More, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who was killed by King Henry VIII, many of you will have seen the, the film The Man for All Seasons, that one, um, was that contemporaries at the time noticed that he and his wife were very much in love with each other. And they commented on it. It was weird. <laughs> weird, but wonderful. I mean, they, people, people were very happy to, to see it, but it was kind of, you know, very nice, but certainly not expected. You got married. If it wasn't a happy situation, then you had a mistress. Or that's what sex workers were for. That's the world. That's how the old homosocial world worked. But, and here's the interesting thing, it was from the 17th century onwards that you began, for the first time, to get a recognition of the existence of the people who we would now call LGBTQ. Why? In a homosocial world, such people are invisible. Because if it's all the men living together, then there will be a huge number of friendships and emotional explorations and actually a very great deal of affection because people have the whole of their emotional development amongst their own sex. But it will never occur to anybody that there are some people who are that way <laughs> by nature. Everything will be a don't ask, don't tell, so long as you don't, call, so long as you don't cause a scandal, basically anything goes on both sides of the divide. That's how homosocial societies work and how they work to this day in many Middle Eastern countries. And now there are documentary evidence for exactly how it works. But once you start getting signs of heterosociality, you begin to get a new world into which a small but regular part of the population don't fit. <laughs> they don't know how to play the new game. They knew how to play the old game. In the old game, you got married and whatever your true emotional or whatever sexual uh, side was, well, pff, that happened, as it were, within an enormous collective closet. <laughs> but once you start having the beginnings of a heterosocial society, it becomes clear that there are some people who, you know, don't fit into the dating game, don't know how to make this work. And of course, initially, those people then start to find meeting places for others like themselves, and that's when you get the first gay pubs and meeting houses. And of course, the first police attention. <laughs> and very quickly, the old scapegoating mechanism comes out. What had been relatively invisible in the Middle Ages starts to become visible. And as it becomes visible, this is a problem. Whose fault is this? And so very quickly it becomes associated, in the case of the English-speaking world, with, uh, with papistry. Because remember that England had had a reformation. In the case of Spain, it became associated with hidden Muslim practices, hidden Moorishness. But in the English-speaking world, for instance, you were part of the papist counter-revolution or the Jesuits. They were all sodomites. And of course, there are, no, there are no such people in England because we're a good Reformation country, but on the continent they have those. 
those wicked people. You've had similar things here in the United States, the, the assumption that Americans weren't like that, but Mexicans were. There's quite a lot of shared religious bigotry in our, in our linguistic past. <laughs> so executions, hangings, quarterings, standard part of uh, what, what used to go on. By the 18th century, in the beginnings of modern medicine, as it were, the discipline shifted. And now people began to think of it as a medical problem, still one that required cruel treatment, because of course it was a problem, and one had to be careful lest, lest it became contaminating or something. Um, but so when people weren't being hanged for it, they were being examined for it. And then as the 18th century became the 19th century, well, psychology started. Well, first of all, actually, there was a mental health before we, what we came psychology. So it was assumed to be a mental health problem. And then psychology came along. And it was only the very late 19th century that, if you like, the social regard was able to say, there is such a thing as a person who just is this way. And they invented the term homosexual. It's a word that was invented in 1869. So anybody who finds the word homosexual in their Bible knows that they have a bad translation. <laughs> yeah, it's good, to, it's good to be aware of that. Uh, but 1869 disappears. It's a clinical term. They're just, they're trying, actually it was invented by someone who's protesting against the Prussians' sodomy laws in the late uh, 19th century. But they came up with this term to try and describe that it wasn't simply a question of a pathology or a vice, but that some people were this way. True, they thought that there was something wrong with them, but they did recognise that actually it was the whole of them that was this way. It wasn't a part that could be easily separated. So that term homosexual became a clinical term, first in German and then in English. Then you had a number of things that made a big difference. One of them was the First World War. In the First World War, a huge number of young men were mobilized. Americans, Brits, French, Germans. A huge number of young women were sent to work in armaments factories all by themselves. And if you were from Nothing Gulch, Tennessee, and had never met anybody like yourself before, you suddenly found that there were other people like you. And when the war was over, if you were lucky enough to survive, you went and lived somewhere nice where there seemed to be others like you. And places like the recently, at that stage, destroyed San Francisco began to get a reputation. Or in the case of women, Santa Fe, New Mexico, which became one of the earliest places in the country known for its Boston marriages, as was, that was how it was described. <laughs> the press, press refi politely referred to Boston marriages. But the particular place where this happened after the First World War was in Germany, where soldiers returning from a lost war, but having met others like themselves, there began to become sufficient density of population for people to be able to learn things about themselves and discover that actually there didn't seem to be much wrong with them, and for observers, scientists, to begin to study them and write books about them. That all, alas, came to a very quick end when the Nazis came to power and they burnt literally all the books and the writings and either killed or exiled the scientists in question. But the first if you like, scientific uh, attempts up to approach this matter scientifically came once there was a sufficient mass of evidence of the different forms of weirdnesses which we uh, throw up, that they were able to look at it and say, I wonder what's going on here. We had the same in the Second World War, and this time, luckily, many more people survived, many more people were mobilised, and many more people were then able to go off and live in different towns and find other people like themselves. And so the mass of evidence, people who started to be able to say, do you know, yes, we are that, and, and so what? And scientists who began to look at them and say, 
Yeah, you're right. So what? And they invented tests, and they were able to show that there is no measurable pathology that is intrinsic to a same-sex orientation. Even Freud had assumed that there was something like paranoia that was held in common by all uh, gay people. And as people have pointed out, if you were a, a gay man in Vienna in the 1890s, perhaps you had good reason to be paranoid. Um, but uh, the scientific regard was able to come into being when there was a sufficient mass of people who'd been able to come alongside and people were able to say, not, you're a problem, I must do something about you, but I wonder what makes you tick. And the people then say, yeah, I too wonder what makes me tick. <laughs> but it's really quite fun. <laughs> and so you start to have serious learning about what is. But what I want to bring out, take us back to our beginning with the witch burnings, is that what we've seen with that journey is how the overcoming of the scapegoat mechanism opened up what really is, which is the logical consequence of the unfurling of the gospel. Which is why what I want to recover, and I want to recover it both for an anti-religious or blasé secular world, which thinks that truth is easily rationally attainable, <laughs> and for a religious world which thinks truth is easily and sacredly obtainable, is no. The work of the Holy Spirit takes its time leading us into all truth. Things that you cannot know now, as someone once said. And that that's the process we're being invited to share. And that is what is opening up matters LGBTQ for us as the ordinary, expected, non-special bleeding fruit of God's act of communication in Jesus. Anyhow, time for a little pause and then uh, we can have some questions and answers if that's okay. Oh, you, you're the boss, Tad, you tell us what to do. Could I? Could I get a glass of water? I think there's a glass of water somewhere. No, perhaps not. Tasha and I are going to pass the plates while we're doing Q&A, and then both she and I will um, come by with the mics. Um, so just go ahead and raise your hands, and we'll come to you if you have a question. Um, and thanks for giving generously. Any questions? Because I've got lots. No? They don't need to be questions. They can be criticisms. They can be <laughs> definitive put-downs. They can be smears. James, no. uh, yeah, I wonder if you could comment on, um, yeah, the, the kind of phrase you repeated many times around the, the process of inhabiting truth, right? It's not something you grasp. It's something um, that we're in, be invite, being invited into. Um, and versus, you know, the opportunity that we also have of uh, being uh, not uh, able to release ourselves from this sort of sacred identity, right? I, I uh, when it comes to, you know, issue X, matters LGBTQ, and I find myself able to inhabit that, um, that truth, um, I've found that for myself and my fellow humans, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm, uh, I'm always going to be open to whatever you describe the unfurling of the gospel is, whatever the, the you know, issue X that's emerging in our midst and the truth. So what, um, so I, I, you know, what do you um, notice in terms of signs of, or habits uh, that we can uh, begin to practice that actually uh, allow us to more fully participate in whatever, you know, the spirit is unveiling, the truth that is emerging. 
Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. And uh, I mean, and it's exactly the right, exactly the right and central central question with how we take this forward, because in the book that I've just written, the, the LGBT issue is essentially just a, a test case for a whole variety of possible um, issues. And actually, uh, in a conversation we had with, with Dave last night, um, he brought out that one of the formulae which I've used before was to turn on its head our usual understanding of the relationship between truth, penitence, and forgiveness. Normally we start with the notion that we know that there's something true, you screw up, if you're penitent, then I'll forgive you. And by forgiving you, I'll be able to restore you to the truth of what really is. Okay? But I want to suggest that that's exactly the wrong way around. That the whole point of the Christian message is that forgiveness is prior to penitence. It's because we discover ourselves forgiven that we're able to become penitent. And as we become penitent, so we are able to learn what is. In other words, creation is achieved by us through forgiveness. Creation is not the starting point. Creation is a dynamic project. And that's the doctrine of original sin is basically saying, you don't start from where you are. <laughs> forgiveness is your access to being created. And that seems to me to be vital to a whole variety of present, present discussions. I mean, you, you know how these... Uh, this struggle between, to, to put it in a nutshell, between wokery and anti-wokery, to give just two, uh, two things. Uh, think about that in this, uh, in this light, because, of course, that discussion, which is a political discussion, there's a sociological discussion, the theological element is not, not brought in. But if one of the things that is inevitably going on, because God wants God's forgiveness to be made available, he likes us. He doesn't want us to destroy ourselves, so he's constantly trying to make his forgiveness available to us. And we are constantly failing to receive it in one of two ways. One way of receiving it is by grasping little bits of the knowledge and right righteousness which it shows up, but then immediately turning around and using them as a weapon at other people. And often enough, woke is exactly that. It's little bits of things that are true and good, but held on to as if a weapon, as if the path of reaching them was merely an intellectual act of conversion rather than a whole change in a pattern of desire. And anti-wokery is impenitence dressed up as righteousness, which is, again, the same thing. I, I, become, uh, I become righteous by being over against that form of thing. But basically, it means I'm impenitent as regards the evil things that woke has at least begun to see <laughs> uh, need to be changed. So the question is, how do we make forgiveness available people, to people so that penitence can become possible? Not how do we browbeat people into agreeing with us. And that is a very difficult task, because I think that the answer is usually only by forms of exemplarity or witness, to use the old language. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. If the image which I've been giving you is true, then it means, of course, we are going to be uncomfortable with every new thing. I mean, there will be some other new thing in which lots of people who now think we're, we're good because we're on the good side in this one will discover ourselves to, to, to be bastards in some way or other. And uh, the learning goes on. You ate beef? <laughs> I, I'm just trying to imagine what, you know what will have our statues torn down by, <laughs> by the next generation. Uh, that's, uh, but that's the kind of thing. But the, the learning process is that. It's, oh my God, we've been caught up in this and we thought it was good. We thought we were righteous doing these things. And that's a very uncomfortable learning process. Particularly the notion that it's our righteousness that's wrong. It's one of the, you know, that's one of the, the reasons why, curiously, there are n number of so-called sins that no one really pays attention because wickedness is relatively easy to pass by. But when someone, you know, 
we are so desperate to be thought good that anybody who challenges our sacred cows, our golden calf, whatever it is, it's there. that's the real, real evil. Because they're suggesting that the whole of the way that we hold our world and our order together is somehow defective. So you're right, it is frightening. And I think that the experience of going through that, I hope that it prepares us for doing it more supply the next time. <laughs> the next time. So I've heard this song before. I remember when I was on that side. This, <laughs> uh, but I think you're absolutely right. I think that, yeah. We have a question back here. So, James, my question is on the very uplifting topic of isolation and despair. Oh, uh, I thought you'd never mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you speak a little bit about those of us, those who, um, and I'm just thinking of my own experiences as a gay man and just watching what's happening and processing those emotions in our, you know, as in real time, so to speak. Yep. Can you speak to what happens when we reach out for that relation and it doesn't happen? That sense of, for example, it seems often when we speak about our own community, sometimes that's when we're least heard and this, or it feels like we're not making that connection. And then that can create, at least for me and for a lot of people I know right now in the LGBT community, at least locally, that are in my life, that sense of despair and sort of isolation, right? When you reach out and your hand, you know, and you don't feel like you've made the connection. And I'm wondering if, if how that fits into what we're talking about tonight and what, mm. what thoughts you might have for I mean, I, caring I, for ourselves. Excuse my, excuse my asking, but can you be a little bit more concrete in the example? Yes. What do you mean by reaching out and the? Yeah. Just, just a relational example of some sort. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, for example, if if um, I'm just thinking of concrete hypothetical of concrete hypothetical. That's a nice paradox. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of a concrete example. Um, for example, being in a room uh, as an only, for example, right? If, you're, if one's an only, the only queer, queer person in the room, the only out queer person in the room. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. You've never attended a bishop's conference. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> and, but the hats are fabulous. Um, well, there seems to be something in them that sucks the brains out of those. <laughs> And you say, you know, this is a thing that's going on and maybe related to your initial question of someone feels uncomfortable with that and they, they say, no, that's, you know, if you say, for example, there's a lot of working with and, 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 and systems in Tacoma specifically that exclude LGBT people from the room or from connection or from um, support. And the first response you get is from someone in this corner that says, oh no, 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 I, uh, I think this is fine, you know, a person who's not an out LGBT person. No, no, it's fine here, right? Um, and this sense of maybe this defensiveness because a, a person doesn't want to think that it's happening nearby because that feels like an indictment of the person um, and makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. When I'm in that, I've been in that scenario a lot over the last year um, and for me, that makes, you know, if I'm just going to be vulnerable about that, that feels very isolating. It feels very discouraging. It feels very frustrating because then, you know, there's several people in the room that might say nothing. There might be one person that comes up to you afterwards and says, oh, I'm sorry you had to go through that, right? 
all these opportunities where a relationship could happen and it doesn't happen, certainly there's, we could, I, and it, I would be open to all of your insights on it, certainly we could speak to the folks in the room, but of the, that are in the room that maybe watch that happen or don't do anything about it, but also just for the person who kind of feels like they need to get up there and speak about what their lived experience is, what their experience as an LGBT person, out LGBT person is, and feels that sort of despair or isolation of, of outright denial of that experience or um, trivialization of that experience. Yeah. Um. Don't let the bastards get to you. That's my first, that's my paraphrase of Jesus is saying, love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. The first step of that is don't let the bastards get to you. Because the reason why we forgive is so as not to be run by the evil that is done to us. It's not because we're good. It's because it's important not allow ourselves to be run by the evil that is done to us. And you are right. Curiously, uh, sometimes people being violent and aggressive towards us is less awful than people ignoring us and treating us to a cowardly silence. And there's much more of the latter than there is of the former. Now, when I've, when I've lived in that, in that circumstance, which I lived <coughs> in quite specifically religious, religious circumstances, it was very important for me to learn that I cannot control what others think of me. I can just begin to affect how I think of others. Not easily. But at least I can begin to exercise my imagination and realize that I'm not so important. And they're not so important either. And they're probably as lost in their non-importance as I am. So what might be ways of playing nice together on a completely different subject? If you like, it's the, it's the changing the rules of the game that are there. Uh, that other thing, but it takes that takes a long time and a big shift, uh, a big shift of imagination. So, it's how to take advantage of that feeling of loneliness. To say, I am not going to allow myself to identify with the victim, because that, in a sense, will be too cheap an identity. It will be a convenient one to them, and it will be a convenient one to me, which is worse because then I'll get myself locked into a form of self-righteousness over against the wicked they. The really difficult thing is to say, you know, I'm not gonna be a victim. I'm not even gonna be a survivor because a survivor is still telling a story of how I was a victim. I'm going to be a creator. I'm gonna be a creator of a new space. What is it going to look like being a creator of a new space? But that, as you know, requires learning to detoxify the isolation <laughs> in, in what our Lord referred to as your pantry or your larder, going into the, the hidden place, the closed place that has no windows, where you can't act, act out to anybody else and where no one else can see you, and learning to receive your reputation, your identity, who you are from quote unquote, your father in heaven. That's being called to being in such a way that you might be able to be creative. And I'm sorry, that's not a, a very comforting answer because it's a long-term one. But that, that has actually, that's how I would describe, I hope, parts of my journey through similarly hostile places that maybe I've never come across anywhere as hostile as Tacoma. I don't think so. <laughs> Sir.
given that our worst instincts as, a, uh, as humans occasion for uh, opportunities for self-sacrifice, and I'm thinking of yesterday I heard that uh, in, uh, in Russia there were a few persons of Ru Russian um, uh, nationals who hacked their way into TV stations and uh, major websites and clearly were blunt and candid about the horrors that Russia is perpetrating on Ukraine. And then they fr freely identified themselves. I see oh, really? that as in self-sacrifice. Um, given how s insidious technology is, where do you find hope for healing? What mm, scholarly discipline, avenue mm. of creativity, the arts, where do you find uh, hope other than the good work and clear-headed, uh, heartfelt work that you do, which we, I appreciate? Hmm, I, I don't know because I'm not sufficiently savvy in the worlds that you're, uh, you're describing. I do think that something very important is happening with that, which is that we are learning to regard distant communication, which seems like something impersonal and not the same as face-to-face, -face, as a real extension of our humanity, not a fake. That's quite difficult for us to get around at first. And people have been inclined to regard them. But actually, we're talking about different ways of human togetherness. And it seems to me that when we start to accept that, that this is here and that it's here to stay, and that it's not a... Um, then we'll be able to start to begin to imagine really fruitful ways of using it. And there are already are plenty of fruitful ways of using it, just in terms of basic communication. But it has been much easier, for instance, for the networks to be used for fake news, for destructive uh, things, because the rest of us haven't yet got used to the notion that actually this is a new form of human community which requires a responsible building, and what's that going to look like? But I think that's actually a big anthropological change in us uh, that I hope will begin to happen uh, now, pre precisely as people lose the sense that this form of communication is somehow not real. Uh, it is. And one of the, the bizarre things about us, humans, is that what is natural to us is precisely <laughs> these inventive forms of being together. <laughs> That's, that is what, what has been the basis of our humanity ever since we first stepped out of whatever pre-bonobo pre we were. Um, so I, I think that there is some hope there as we take consciousness of this. Um, one of the things that I take hope in, and this is as a, a gay man, as a gay priest, um, is often precisely because on this issue of what's natural or not, many of us have had to go through quite a long journey, starting really quite young, to be able to tell the truth. And not just the truth about who we are, but the truth in general. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is that actually people are becoming very respectful of that. That the interesting thing about out people, whether they're out as gay or lesbian or trans, is that they're becoming respected as more likely to be truthful because they've had to walk a path, if you like, uh, even before becoming a politician or a, um, a TV presenter or whatever. So I'm, I'm hoping that we will learn to, uh, that we will learn to help create spaces where truthfulness are possible, because it seems to me that that is a real uh, social crisis uh, uh, right now. Precisely because it's been hard for us. For those for whom it's easy, um, you haven't had to think about it so much. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm sorry, I'm probably far, uh, firing, firing blanks. I think I'm biased on the other side, so uh, I needed that. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you use this? 
Oh, sorry, am I not working yet? It's just a little ringy and some oh. people are having a hard time with it. Shall I turn this off then? Do you want a mic? Do you want a mic? I'll use my inside, I'll use my inside voice. Oh. So LGBTQ issues used to be uh, primarily political, and I heard you make a statement earlier that said, "Ah, but that's politics, and we're not going to go there tonight." And 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 LGBTQ issues are now mm, for today not supposedly political. But who knows what's happening tomorrow? I, I would like to hear you talk about policy. Politics is really supposed to be about policy making, policy adoption, and this LGBTQ in specific, if you'd like to address that, or any of the issues that are <clears throat> transecting religion and politics right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, abortion, I'd love to hear you talk about that right this second. And you can say no, I'm open to being told no. But... Well, I, I, I don't know whether my accent gives it away, but I'm not a citizen of this country. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, while I follow your news very closely and I'm aware of the impending, the impending hour of doom on Roe versus Wade. Um, it kind of amazes me that it wasn't obvious to everybody that this was going to happen sometime this year, and that everybody has been taken by surprise by it because that was what those judges were appointed for, corruptly but rarely, and so that's what they're going to do. Uh, as somebody who comes from a country without a constitution uh, or without a written constitution and who lives in Europe where this is more or less invariably being treated as a matter of public health policy rather than a constitutional right. I can't say that I would miss Ro Roe versus Wade, not because um, I don't want you to have all the rights, but because I think that defining something as a constitutional right and then having endless political battles about law are not helpful. So it seems to me that uh, if I had my druthers, which I don't, I would be saying to the Democrats, for God's sake, get out and tell people to have a discussion about what people really want in practical terms. <laughs> uh, because a majority of you want good reproductive health care available for women, at least for a certain number of weeks after a conception, and that is what happens, uh, have a public discussion about it, rather than treating the whole thing as a legal issue. The GOP have been brilliant at making use of the legal argument of Roe versus Wade as a single issue button to drive, their, to drive people to the polls. Curiously, they're about to shoot themselves in the foot, uh, politically. So the whole question, I think, is are you prepared to have a discussion about what is true with relation to uh, uh, women's health at the local level? Because if this is now going to be decided at a state by state level, it will no longer be the sort of thing that, as it were, nice middle class mums uh, in GOP leaning areas can say, well, I can vote for them because that's a Washington issue, really. No, nope, no longer. <laughs> it's now going to be a local issue. Um, so that's my view, excuse me, as a boring European with a kind of sense that this ought to be a public health discussion and not a legal discussion, but that's my prejudice. Would you hold the same for LGBTQ questions of marriage and that sort of, I mean, there's a lot of things that it's, it's LGBTQ, it's women's rights, it's racism, there's these things that oh, that, yeah. are being Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, and there are issues of learning, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that your, your country was founded on, a particular relationship between enlightenment 
uh, philosophy and Protestant religion. And that's a toxic mix. <laughs> and those two are going to be fighting each other for a few centuries more, is my guess. Um, uh, the, because, I mean, how else would you reach, would you, do you reach collective definitions? In this country, you attempt to reach collective definitions through your legal process. But that means that law and the definitions of law are all. Yeah, so I, I too fear that if Roe versus Wade goes, the same people who certainly want to get rid of Ob Obergefell as <laughs> uh, uh, that will be the next in the line and then they want to get rid of Brown versus the Board of Education and you know, you know the history as well as I do. You know that when Roe versus Wade was decided, it wasn't objected to at all by the nascent religious right of the time. The Baptist Convention publicly applauded it. It was fixed on deliberately, as, as you say, as a political maneuver, by people who were worried about, I think it was Liberty, or one of the other universities, losing uh, the status of being able to receive federal funds because of excluding black people. That was the, uh, that was the real issue. But they realized, the, the leaders of that time realized that they were never going to get the population on board defending the right of religious universities or colleges to be able to exclude black people. So they needed to create a coalition around something uh, that would be able to bring people together and would be a good, uh, a good fight for religious freedom against the oppression of our rights. So they settled on Roe versus Wade because they could get the Catholics alongside that because the Catholics would never have gone along with the race thing. And boom, there you are. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Was, uh, the, the political history of that is, is uh, deeply, deeply deceptive. Um, uh, so how do we, these things stick? Well, they stick when people become aware and happy and realize that this is good for them. Um, and that takes different forms in your, in your culture than it does in the ones that I'm used to. Uh, uh, to, to living in but why I answer this badly because I, I don't swim naturally in the kind of waters that are to do with legal rights and and political rights uh, just because it's not my heritage <laughs> but uh, I hope I've at least shared my sympathy with <laughs> yes since there are people zooming in so first, James, how would you respond to Christians who believe accepting Freud and others has distorted the Christian view of personhood and therefore resist hearing the witness of LGBTQ plus peoples? Who, but it's interesting. You see, I, I don't know. Yeah. Can you repeat that so that I can understand it better? Yes. How would you respond to Christians who believe accepting Freud and others has distorted the Christian view of personhood and therefore resist hearing the witness of LGBTQ plus peoples? I solemnly swear before this Senate hearing that I do not now and I never have been a member of the Freud believing party. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, it seems to me that what was interesting about Freud was not any of his particular ideas, many of which were wrong, uh, but his introduction of a practice, which is the notion of the importance of talking about things. And that the real challenge has been how things that used not to be talked about have become talkable. And that, not anything else, has changed what it means that people understand to be the human person. I think that one of the really, my first response if I was in such a discussion would be to ask somebody what they meant by a human person and where they got their definition from. Because if the human person is this fixed thing that has no change over time, then I think it would be pretty unrecognizable to most of us. We have changed enormously and carry on changing. And one of the things that has happened over the last 
particularly 150 years, is how we've been able to be to talk about things more exactly, more intimately, but also more publicly that before were not talked about. And that has made us aware of certain things about ourselves that were hidden over before. In other words, as persons, we are linguistic persons. The human person is always linguistic. And actually, our language is not simply a reflection of what we are, it's creative of who we are. So, I would say to them, Freud is not your problem. In a sense, bad Freudianism has been behind some of the worst pieces of Christian morality, which I completely reject. For instance, the notion that the sexual uh, instinct is the strongest of the human instincts. That, that's Freud. That's very convenient curiously, to the most conservative Christians, <laughs> for whom sin is particularly concentrated in the area of the sixth or seventh commandment, depending on which version <laughs> uh, you use. But I don't think that's true. I think that our uh, uh, rivalry is much stronger than sex, and that typically our sexual appetite is forged by our rivalry rather than uh, the other way around and pacify, pacify their own. So, not a Freudian reading. The question is, what is the form of flourishing of any human person that we come across? What does it look like for people to flourish? And that's what I would ask them. What's your account of flourishing? As far as I can see, my account of flourishing is that as we discover people who discover themselves not to be who they are supposed to be, they do find themselves able to flourish. And with that, they discover their common humanity with other human persons. <laughs> but that's just me. Thank you, and we have one last question. Do you feel much hopefulness about the American church going in a new and better direction? Mm. Um, well, I, I, have, I have such intense and deep knowledge of every element of the American church that I can only give you an infallible answer on this one. Um, uh, I can only really answer that as a Catholic. Uh, and the American Catholic Church, particularly the American Catholic hierarchy, uh, I regard as one of the, the most hopeless of, of all the Catholic hierarchies one of the most schismatic and self-legalistic uh, and lock locked in sort of Gaga world, and not Lady Gaga, which would be a great deal, great deal, <laughs> uh, great deal nicer. Um, they've, they've locked themselves in a legalistic and moralistic trap. Um, and I, I, yeah, I mean, it took, it took John Paul 25 years to manage to uh, eviscerate their intelligent, more intelligent and supple members. So I'm afraid it will take Francis longer than his current nine years uh, to be able to choose, though he has, he's obviously chosen, but there's still a, a strong minority of people who are aware that, that Catholicism is a Mediterranean religion in which you uh, don't hold legalistically to a huge plethora of laws. You learn to navigate them with a view to making things be as best they can be. But uh, so as a point which I've made today first, the, the truly difficult thing for American Catholics is that they live in a basically Protestant culture. And basic Protestant culture is a good thing. You have very, very few rules and you adhere to them very strongly. That's good. There's something clean about that. Catholic has a a huge plethora of rules covering every eventuality. And you navigate them prudently, a.k.a. what Protestants call hypocrisy. Um, <laughs> um, but that's the whole point. That's the whole point. But what you have in this country is Catholic plethora of rules held with a Protestant conscience. Apply all of them as if they were all of the same value. And that's what you get. You get people who are uh, customs officials busy stamping. No, no, it's terribly, terribly sad. And they've, they've been very resistant so far to Pope Francis's attempt to 
nudge them back into the Christian mainstream. But it, you can tell what a weird world we're in, where the Vatican is streets ahead. Rome is streets ahead of the American hierarchy in terms of public positions on a whole lot of issues. <laughs> but beyond that, I can't say. Thank you so much. I've never had anybody wipe the mic for me. Before. Never had such a back. Never had such a sweaty hand. <laughs> yes, Let's give it up for James. I don't know about you, but as usual, I have a lot to think about. Um, thank you for gracing us with your presence this evening. Um, thank you, James, for taking the time to be with us. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dave and Melissa and Noah and Carrie and folks from the Leadership Foundation who really helped bring James to the Northwest uh, for a variety of things and we got to uh, be a part of that so thank you so much for that. Um, you are all invited to join us downstairs. Lynn always puts on a beautiful and delicious spread. I assume there are alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages as well as some snacks. Um, thanks for being with us. Have a good night. <laughs>